Good morning, everyone. Hey, it is so good to see you. Uh, today, we're in week two of this study of the book of John. Uh, hopefully, if you were here last week, uh, you grabbed one of these cards. If you weren't here last week, there's some out at the Welcome Center. Uh, and what these are is we are reading the book of John together. Uh, we're hitting highlights on Sunday mornings, but then all week, uh, we're spending a couple minutes each day reading through this together. And so hopefully you've been doing that. If you haven't, uh, then jump in. Encourage you to start. Uh, all this is kind of going to come together on Easter morning uh, as we talk about this series, The Best is Coming, as we look forward to what Jesus is doing and going to do uh, moving ahead. Last week, we jumped in with this idea that Jesus is coming to bring change. He's coming to bring change, and we talked about this first miracle that Jesus did when he changed water to wine, which seems like an odd place to start. Out of all of the things he could have done to start with uh, water to wine uh, at a wedding party, seems like an odd place to begin and kind of launch his ministry. But what it does is it illustrates to them, uh, as he kind of gets this thing off the ground, and as well as us today, is that Jesus is able to change the circumstances of our life. He's able to change the big circumstances. He's able to step into the small circumstances. And he wants to step into those moments and to change different elements of our life. With the series, we're answering this question week in and week out. Why did Jesus come? Why did Jesus come? Why did, why did he step onto this earth? Why did he leave something so good in heaven and step into uh, the brokenness of this world? And the easy, simple, quick answer is he came to save us from our sin. But on top of that, there are so many more layers of him bringing uh, ministry to this world and bringing a new kingdom. And that's some of the aspects that we are looking at. And as Jesus comes to bring change, uh, I guess my question is, on what ground? Like, what is it that gives Jesus the ability to bring about change? On what ground does Jesus stand on? And and this morning, we're going to stand alongside or in the middle of a crowd of religious people, and Jesus begins to explain what ground he stands on. He begins to uh, uh, bring detail of the power that he has within his ministry. And as he explains this, and as we stand in the crowd this morning and listen in, it's not just something, oh, well, yeah, that's Jesus. When we hear Jesus' claims this morning, it should shake us to the core. I want to pray. We're going to jump in. God, I am so thankful for your church. Got a place that is unlike should be unlike any other place on this earth. God, where we can be real and we can be transparent and we can be honest. God, where we can celebrate and learn who you are. God, not just to gain knowledge, but God, to find life. And so, Father, I I pray that this morning we will do that. I pray this morning that as we stand in this crowd of religious people and we listen to your words, Father, I plead this morning. That they're not just words about you. But God, I pray that they are words that transform us. God, I'm thankful. I'm thankful that we can laugh together. I'm thankful that we can smile. That we don't have to be perfect walking in this room. And God, I know that some of us this morning, uh, we walked in and we had great weeks full of celebration and joy. And there's some of us that we had weeks that were filled with stress and worry and brokenness. And Father, no, no matter what got us here and what's behind us. Father, I pray in this moment that you will energize and refresh us, that you will remind us that we have hope in you, and you will encourage us moving forward. We love you, and it's your name we pray. Amen. There's a couple gentlemen that I want to introduce you to. Maybe some of you have heard uh, of a couple of these guys. They, their lives tell stories uh, that maybe shine a little bit brighter than others. Uh, the first guy, his name is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, it sounds a little bit strange. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, he was a German pastor. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was born into a home where no one wanted anything to do with faith. Uh, they were highly knowledgeable and not religious whatsoever. He was born into this family. His dad was a professor, and he decided, he decided at the age of 14 that he was going to become a pastor. So he announces this to his family, uh, to his parents, and they are not thrilled. They discourage his choice. Uh, they're not excited about it, and they let him know about it. However, that wasn't enough to keep him away. He begins to spend time learning what it means to be a pastor, studying uh, the truth. And after some time, he, he finally kind of gets off the ground to the point where he finally authored a book called The Cost of Discipleship. What it means to be a 
disciple. And in that book, he is quoted in saying this. Cheap grace is preaching forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Well, there's a lot of smart guys that write a book. But what is it that sets Dietrich Bonhoeffer apart? You see, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German pastor during the Nazi regime. And he knew that just being a pastor wasn't enough. And so he signed up to be in the German secret service. And his goal in this to work was to work as a double agent. And so he would travel. He would travel to church conferences all over Europe. And he was supposed to be collecting information about the places that he visited. But instead, he was trying to help Jews escape Nazi oppression. And often, many times, Bonhoeffer became a part of a plot to overthrow and later assassinate Hitler. And he found himself in the middle of several of these situations, never being able to conquer his goal. However, he worked tirelessly to be a follower of Jesus, to work as a double agent, to rescue Jewish people from the oppression that they were speaking about, finally to the point where he was caught. And as he was caught, he was transferred to an extermination camp. And on April 9, 1945, one month before Germany surrendered, he was hung with six other resistors. The second guy I'd like to tell you about, his name is Jim Elliott. Jim Elliott was born in Portland, Oregon. He, like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, grew up in a family that really didn't want anything to do with faith or religion. He attended Wheaton College. And someplace between when he was growing up and when he went to college, he decided as well that he wanted to bring the good news of Jesus to other people. He goes to Wheaton College, and while he was in college, he was so passionate about this desire to go and tell others that oftentimes he and his wife, Elizabeth, who he met there at college, they would take the train up to Chicago, and they would spend the weekend in Chicago in train stations just telling people the gospel, the good news about Jesus. He graduates, he leaves Wheaton, and after some time he moves down to Ecuador with his wife and another couple that are good friends because he has this passion to bring the message of Jesus to the people in Ecuador. As he moves in, he learns about different tribes and different people in Ecuador, one of them, one of them being the Wodoni tribe in Ecuador. This was a group of people that were completely unchurched. They had no idea who Jesus was, what faith was, what religion was. And after some conversations trying to make this happen, Jim Elliott, along with a couple other people and their pilot, they take off to head into a remote part of the jungle where this tribe was. They land their plane, and after a couple weak attempts of communication with the people that come out to meet them, they are assassinated right there along the river where they landed their plane. As I look at these two guys, and there are other stories out there, as I look at these two guys, there's, there's something about their actions I ask myself the question, reading their different stories, what is it that brings them confidence to live the way that they lived? Bonhoeffer standing against rulers, standing against police, standing against all of these other people. What is it that gives him the confidence to live that way? What is it that gives Jim Elliot the confidence to fly into a jungle? And really, what is the similarity between them? As I read these stories and I study these individuals, here's what I see is these two individuals, these two men, recognized and trusted in the, in the power and authority of Jesus above everything else in this world. Because, friends, our truth of where we're at this morning, before we see Jesus' words, are when we trust in the authority of Jesus, it changes the authority of our lives. When we trust in the authority of Jesus, it changes the authority in our lives, which is something so difficult for a room full of Jewish people to understand, which is where we find Jesus this morning. Jesus is standing among a crowd of, of Jewish people. 
Jewish people, they have their law, they have everything kind of set and broken down to their understanding. And all of a sudden, Jesus is now stepping into the middle of this and kind of breaking it apart. If you brought a Bible, we're going to be in John chapter 5 this morning. John chapter 5, we were in chapter 2 last week, we're in chapter 5 this week. John chapter 5, and as John chapter 5 begins, Jesus is walking by this pool, it was known as the healing pool, which means people who were sick with all kinds of diseases would come and they would sit by this pool in hopes that it would bring healing to them. As Jesus is walking by, he recognizes that there's a man that's been sitting there for a long time, and he heals this man sitting next to this pool. Now, what's the big deal with that? Well, the big deal is that it's the Sabbath day, the day of rest. And so as Jesus heals this man on the Sabbath day, what we need to know is that this is, this is something that you don't do. There are Jewish laws against doing too much or too little on the Sabbath. And so you didn't do anything. It was a day of rest. And so for Jesus to step in and to heal a man on the Sabbath immediately puts Jesus in hot water with the Jewish people. And they they don't know what to do. And so they begin... They begin to corner Jesus. They begin to persecute him as we're going to read. And as they do that, Jesus is going going to respond. And as Jesus responds... We learn together what authority really looks like. John chapter 5, we're going to begin verse 16. It says, so because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, meaning healing, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, But he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. Jesus Jesus gave them this answer. Here it is. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He He can do only what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these. So that you will be amazed. For just as the Father raises dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who has sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Very truly, I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the son of man. Do not be amazed by this for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear and my judgment is just for I seek not to please myself but him who sent me. Now, that's a lot of information to take in at one time. So we're going to kind of break it down a little bit to understand what Jesus is saying. The Jewish people, they have grown up. They have grown up uh, from a young time. If they, were, if they were born into Judaism, they have grown up worshiping the Father, worshiping Yahweh God. Okay, which is the God of the Old Testament. They have, there is no one above him. There is no one equal to. There is nothing uh, more important than Yahweh God. He was the one that gives the law. He's the one that teaches the law. And so every bit of their religion and worship has been built around worshiping Yahweh God. And so now Jesus waltzes into the room after breaking their law. And he more or less says, I am equal to the Father. I am equal to the God that you worship. I'm even. And and before, you see, what we need to understand is that we get to turn the page. We get the rest of the story. We get all of the other information. But for the Jews, it would be like right now, okay, the door's swinging open. And someone that none of us know, he walked down, stand right here, look at me, and then look at all of us and say, 
I'm the same as Jesus. God has sent me to you to bring about truth, to judge who gets to go to heaven and who doesn't. And so I have been sent by God to work for him and you need to come follow me. How many of us are in? Right? No, my first thought is, where's our security team? Like, how, who's going to help this guy out the door? You know, what on earth is going on? And we see some of the, we see people like this in tabloid magazines, the next Jesus Christ. And they have followers. You see, for someone to waltz in right now, most of us in the room, we're probably not jumping on that train right away, are we? You're like, wait a minute. There's no one equal to Jesus. I mean, the Father sent him, and there's, there's no one that can match up. There's no one that can do what he can do. We would dismiss. We would see it as strange. We, would, we should be a little bit offended by someone claiming to have that authority and power. You see, for the Jewish people, that's right where they're at, to the point where it's offensive. Offensive to the point of trying to kill him. Jesus has stepped into their lives. He's broken their laws. And now all of a sudden he's saying, everything that you have known growing up, everything that you have worshipped, everything that you have built your religion on, I'm equal to. And not only am I equal to, I, I can bring the dead to life. If our made up individual looks at us and says, hey, I can bring dead people back to life. Oh, can you? You know, we're questioning, right? We're thinking it's a little bit ridiculous. We're coming up with reasons why this person is making the statement. Hey, for for a dead person to come back to life is unclean. Hey, to to come in contact with that person who was dead is unclean. And just and so now this guy is saying, "Oh, well, wait a minute! I, I I have come to bring life." I'm equal to the Father, and I've come to bring life. I have the authority to bring dead bones back to life. For the Jewish people, I mean, this is a slap across the face. It confronts every bit of who they are and what they've known. And Jesus is standing, standing on this ground in content, saying, this is who I am. I am God and equal to God. I bring life, eternal life. You see, as Jesus communicates to these Jewish people, when he says, I bring life, what he's, what he's not necessarily saying is, I walk up to graves and say, hey, come on out, you've got a couple weeks left. He's saying, listen, the brokenness and the death that walks around this earth with no hope, I bring hope too. I give the promise of eternal life. And that's what my life brings as the son. And there is a new way. There is a new road. There is a new kingdom. And it leads to eternal life. And this is what I bring. Finally, Jesus stands before this crowd and he says, I am judge. I have been given the authority to be the judge. I will call people to life, and if they obey, then they get heaven, and if they don't, then they're condemned. And for the Jewish people, there is only one judge, and it is God above. You see, the claims that Jesus makes in this section about his authority, they don't just rattle the Jewish people. They insult. They challenge And they confront everything that these people have known. Which, friends, is the same thing that Jesus should do in our lives as well. When we allow the authority of Jesus, the power of Jesus, the holiness of Jesus, the judgment, when we allow it to invade our lives, it should shake, it should confront, it should upset because it should pull the parts of our life that are not like him and it should rip them out. You see, when we trust in the authority of Jesus, it changes the authority of our lives. Mark Moore, he wrote this. He says, Jesus, right here, Jesus does what the Father does, sees what the Father sees, breathes the same life and speaks the same declaration of judgment. What Jesus is asking of these Jewish people is to offer him the same worship as Yahweh God. And the struggle for these 
early Jewish people is the same struggle for us today. Is that they're not, their religion has been based on knowledge. And as Jesus steps into this world, he, he is offering something different. However, it's built on trust. We can learn knowledge. But trust? Trust is harder, isn't it? To trust that Jesus will do what he says he will do. That's hard. To trust that Jesus has control over the situations in our life that we want control over is hard. To trust that Jesus is going to be good when he says that he's going to be good is hard. When things in this world are not, trust is hard. For these people and for us today, our religion is not built on knowledge. The authority that we stand on and the authority that we are called to live with is built on trust. And when we trust in the authority of Jesus, it changes the authority of our lives. Jesus is communicating this kind of father see, son do type thing. Which I didn't quite grasp hold of until I have a son that follows me around everywhere. Which I love most of the time until I say something I shouldn't or do something that I shouldn't because I'm an earthly dad. And then it's repeated right behind me. I'm like, no, don't say that. Don't do it. Right? I'm not the only one in the room. And so as Levi follows me and now Jack is getting older and he's just tearing our house apart and sometimes following. I, I see what Jesus is meaning here because Levi will see me do something or hear me say something and the next thing I know I'm hearing him say that. And if it's good, it's great. And if it's not, it's shameful. What Jesus is communicating to these people is, listen, I have seen my father, the one that you worship, the one that holds authority in your life. I have learned from him. I have seen how he works. And so now I bring this to you, but I bring more than just your rules of religion. I bring, I bring you life. And when the Jewish people, they don't know what to do and they don't know how to respond, they get defensive. I'm sure we've never been there, but I'm, I bet we have. We don't know how to respond. We don't know what to say back. We just feel like we need to defend ourselves. Even if it wasn't a, de- a defensive argument of any kind, it's like, I don't know what to do, so I'm going to fight back. It's like, ah, it wasn't a fight, but that's kind of our natural instinct. The Jewish people, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to handle this. And they don't know how to respond to someone claiming to be God who has done miraculous things. And so what do they do? Let's kill him. That's their response. Because trust is too hard to be defensive and and to try to kill this guy. That's easier than trusting in what Jesus is asking. And I would imagine, I would imagine that there are some of us that we, maybe not intentionally, but sometimes have done the same thing. Sometimes it's easier to get mad at God than trust in God, isn't it? Sometimes, Sometimes it's easier to argue with God than trust in God, isn't it? You see, friends, what we need to also grasp hold of is that there is a difference. There is a difference in standing in confidence in the authority of Jesus and standing in arrogance. And sometimes, sometimes, I'm not necessarily even saying here, but sometimes we stand in the confidence of Jesus and we become this holy arrogant Which is not what Jesus is saying. He's not saying, listen, my authority gives you the right to beat everybody else up. My authority gives you the right to tell everybody else how they're sinning. My authority gives you the right to step into all kinds of political conversations and throw my word in the middle of it. You see, the authority of Jesus gives us confidence to stand on a ground that we know is proven and stand on a ground that we are confident in and stand on a ground that brings us life. And so if our comments are not life-bringing, then they're not comments that we should have at all. If our words do not stand on the authority of Jesus and bring life, then maybe we don't need to bring those words. There's a difference between staying in confidence and staying in arrogance. One says, I trust Jesus, and one says, I trust me. And when we trust in the authority of Jesus, it changes the authority of our lives. Jesus says to these people, my authority is over you. My authority is leading you. 
my authority is around you. My question this morning is this. It's great to know the power of Jesus. It's, it's great to hear what Jesus claims about himself as he speaks truth. But my question this morning is this. Is if the authority of Jesus, if it does not take an authoritative role in our lives, it's not the authority of Jesus. And so if we trust in the authority of Jesus, Jesus stands in front of a crowd and declares with confidence the ground he stands on and what power. What ground do you stand on? And who do you stand in front of? What ground do you stand on and who do you stand in front of? Jesus stood on the ground of the authority of his father and he stands in front of a bunch of people questioning who he is. Do we stand on the ground of the authority of Jesus in our lives? Where we have given him permission to invade every depth of our soul and every bit of our being to bring life, to bring hope, to bring confidence Who do we stand in front of? Do we stand in front of people who are questioning who Jesus is? Or do we just stand in front of the people that are easy to talk to? Do we stand in front of a crowd that we've created for ourselves? Do we stand in front of people that we just like? Who do we stand in front of? When Jesus delivers these words, there's no question in his mind of who he is. And when we stand, is there a question in our minds? of who Jesus is and what he wants to do with our lives. If the authority of Jesus does not take an authoritative role in our life, if it does not change what we do, what we say, if it does not dictate our behavior, then it's not the authority of Jesus. It's our comfort, it's our want to. If we stand in confidence but just promote ourselves, then we're not following in the authority of Jesus. You see, when we trust in the authority of Jesus, it changes the authority in our lives. It changes the power that we trust in. It changes the power that we find confidence in. When we trust in the authority of Jesus, what we are saying is, I believe that the same Jesus that called demons out of a man, I believe that he will step into my life. And the same Jesus that called Lazarus out of a grave to bring him life, I believe that he will bring me life. The same Jesus that found a leper on the side of the road and pulled the sickness out of his body is the same Jesus that I follow with every bit of my being. The same Jesus that rolled a stone after three days in a tomb is the same Jesus that I find confidence in today in my life. You see, when we trust in the authority of Jesus, the power, the strength, it changes the authority of our lives. What ground do we stand on? And who do we stand in front of? When I was in high school, a uh, minister at our church, my youth minister, he always wanted to try to give us as many opportunities to serve as possible. And one of the ways that he uh, always offered us uh, every month was an opportunity to serve at this place called Teen Challenge. Teen Challenge was a, uh, it's a drug and alcohol rehabilitation center, and there are uh, houses all over the United States. There are men's homes and there are women's homes. And sometimes you can recognize the struggle in your own life and you can then admit yourself, but other times it, it takes someone in authority admitting you. But every month we would go uh, down to this house in downtown Buffalo uh, and it was, it was a male house and every month we would cook dinner for them and then we would do some sort of like worship service, we would, something uh, to kind of encourage them. Every month we would show up and they would always be excited. We'd sit down, we'd talk with them uh, over dinner. And at the end of every night, they would normally, a couple of them would share what God has done in their life, some of their testimony, their story. And then they would all end in singing this song. And part of the song, it, it would always just repeat, I've got my mind made up, my mind is fixed. I'm going with Jesus all the way. And they would repeat that a couple times. And they would get louder and louder each time. And every, every time, I remember, it was always, we'd always stand in a circle. That's how we ended the night. Look around and I would see guys that, from just learning some of their stories over dinner, guys that had been addicted to every drug that's out there. Guys who had drank their marriage into shambles. Guys that have been arrested all over the place. And they would just 
I billow these words. I've got my mind made up. My mind is fixed. I'm going with Jesus all the way. One week I, that we were there, I was talking to this guy. I can't remember his name. It was after we sang that song. And I just asked him, I said, what is it? What is it that really makes you want to sing that song? And he kind of paused and he looked at me. And he said, kid. He said, I've spent my whole life running and fighting with every bit of authority on this earth. I finally figured out I need to turn my life over to an authority that's outside of this earth. And as a 16, 17 year old kid, I didn't have a clue what that meant really. But more and more in the struggles of life and the ups and downs of life, I realized that there is an authority that is above everything in this world the best in the broken of this world, there is an authority that brings life, that brings hope. And I would imagine this morning that, I would imagine this morning that there are maybe a few of us that we can relate to this guy. There are some of us in the room that maybe we're struggling, pushing and pulling against the authority of this world. And maybe this morning, Maybe this morning we need to try the authority of Jesus to step into our lives. I would also imagine that maybe not earthly authorities, but I would imagine that there are a bunch of us in the room that we're fighting the authority of Jesus. We're fighting control and letting go of it. We're fighting trust and believing in it. But we're fighting the goodness because we think we can do better. And we, we love to worship and we love to sing, but when it comes to handing over who we are to the authority and the power of Jesus, it's a hard let go. And so like this guy, we're spending days, day in and day out, worrying and filled with stress to the point of being sick because we want control, but yet we know that Jesus is the authority in our lives. And so it just causes this tension. And this morning, will you hand that authority over? For some of us, that means just a simple prayer of God. I know I started this. Help me get back to it. For some of us this morning, it means that we surrender our lives. We step into the waters of baptism and say, it's not my authority anymore, it's yours. And I'm getting out of the way. Instead of getting defensive, and to, instead of arguing back and pushing back, I'm saying, I'm done. I trust you, Jesus. And for some of us, today's that day that we say, God, I'm not in charge, you are. Friends, we can push and we can pull, or we can trust. And when we trust in the authority of Jesus, it changes the authority of our lives. Why don't we stand together? We're going to worship and we're going to sing. We're going to sing a song that declares Jesus' words, that declares the power of the Father in heaven that we worship. And there's some of us that we're not going to know this song, and that's okay. We're going to let the words soak into our minds. We're going to let the message that there is a Father in heaven who loves us, who sent his son to die for us, whose power lives in us, and that there is a power of a Father that sits in heaven waiting for his children to come home. There is a Father who's crazy about us, who wants us to pursue an adventure with him. There is a Father that lives with all authority in heaven and on earth and looks at us and says, you are mine. And because he looks at us that way, this morning, have we allowed the authority of Jesus to change the authority of our lives? Let's worship together.